الحمد لله نحمده تعالى ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كله ولو كره الكافرون نحمده تعالى على نعماء لا نحصي ثناء عليه هو كما اثنى على نفس او اثنى عليه رسوله عليه الصلاه والسلام نشكره ولا نكفر نؤمن به ونتوكل عليه هو مولانا وعلى الله فليتوكل المؤمنون فيا عباد الله ويا معشر المسلمين الله سبحانه وتعالى يقول في الكتاب الكريم بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرق I start in the name of Allah the compassionate the merciful and I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one and only God, as I also bear witness that Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam is a messenger and servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He who Allah has guided aright is the one who is guided to the right path. And he who does not have the guidance of Allah has been left to go astray and has no other guidance except the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today I want to talk to you about an important matter. Some of you may recall that one year ago, this masjid opened its doors. Walhamdulillah, from then on until now, we have come a long way and many things have happened. So this week last year, this center opened its doors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had intended for this deen to be the religion of the earth, that Islam was to be of the north as it was to be of the south, that Islam will go east as it did now, it has come west as well. In all the four corners of the earth, Alhamdulillah, when you look, Islam has touched those four corners of the earth. And so wherever you are as a human being, that individual, that person, he or she, you must always look and reflect on your condition, the moment that you're in, the journey that led you there, and what lays ahead in future. Because Islam is not only interested in the Islam of us only, but also the Islam of our children and the children of our children. So that there is this continuation of an unbroken chain of believers throughout time. Al-Anbiya wal Mursaleen. They were leaders of their communities. And they wanted to see one main result, that the generation that will come after them will all be saying, La ilaha illallah. So they are interesting example of Al-Anbiya in the Quran. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ hadith," That we have made them, Al-Anbiya wal Mursaleen, the messengers and the prophets, to be as stories and as examples to us for mankind. And Mufassirin say this means to learn lessons, not just stories we will share, but also to learn lessons. 
So today I want to take to you, I want to, I want to take you through four stories. And I want you to see for a moment what is it that you take home as the lesson from this story? And then let us see some of the beautiful things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once captured in these examples. And we will start with the best of the human creation. Afdal al khalqila al rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Most of us know this famous story of a journey that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took to go to a taif. But many of us also understand a taif was a place for the aristocrats of Mecca at that time. The wealthy, the well-to-do, it was a vacationing place of some type because it was up in the mountains, green, luscious, good weather. And even now, the rulers of Saudi, they have homes there. If you ever visit a taif, you will see they still go there for vacationing. A Rasul وسلم, took a journey to Taif in a year that is considered the saddest year and the hardest year of the Rasul. His uncle had just passed, Abu Talib. And then, together with that, his wife Khadija radiallahu anha also had passed. So, two people that were dear to the Rasul وسلم, had passed away. So, what surrounded the Rasul وسلم, was a lot of sadness and grief. These are the circumstances in which he is taking this journey. And if you look at the geography of the region, a taif is in the mountain areas. And a Rasul takes a journey on foot at the age that he's in, over 50 years almost, without transportation, a distance of about 100 kilometers from the city of Mecca into the mountain territory of a taif. Not walking on easy grass in the park like you're walking, no. Someone of his age, he's taking this journey on foot. He doesn't want to create attention among the Quraysh who had started to boycott the Muslims at that time. So he don't want it to be known where he was going. The da'wah there had stagnated and he wanted to go to a taif to call them to la ilaha illallah. And we know what happened when he reached there. When the Rasul ﷺ was chased out of that city with all sorts of cursing words and stoning, he eventually takes shelter in a, in, in a vineyard of some type, in a garden. It is at that moment that he makes the dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah, to soothe him, sends Jibreel alayhi salam. Together with Jibreel is Malak al-Jibal, the angel of the mountains. So Jibreel is speaking. He said, Ya Rasulullah, with me is the angel of the mountain. And the angel of the mountain introduces himself. He says, I am the angel of the mountains. With your permission, I will crush this city. Of the abuse they had done to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi salam. But here is the lesson I want us to take. This is where the story climaxes. The answer that was given by the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was an answer to protect the lives of the people there and to look at a situation that may come in future where Muslims will be living there and our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted people to come to Islam, not to leave the fold of Islam. And so he refused to give the permission to the angel. And instead he told them that perchance in future Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring Muslims to this place. He refused to give that order. What is the lesson you take from this? The prophet of mercy maybe, alayhi salatu was salam. What other lessons can you take from the idea that we open doors to Muslims converts, reverts, to come into the fold of Islam. And we don't close the door to those who are beginning in the learning process. As a Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi considered them ignorant at that time. And he didn't shut the door. And he had the power and the authority to cause the destruction of an entire city. 
But instead, a Rasul wanted that city to experience Islam. And he knew with time Islam will reach there and they will accept it on their own terms. When we were doing da'wah with the other centers previous to this one, for many years we spoke of how people came to Islam. We said many a times that after 9-11, it was very common to see 30, 40 people accepting Islam. But a lot of times, those of us who continue to do the da'wah, 85% of those people we never saw again. A recent study came out and there are shocking numbers of reverts who went back to their kufr. So while we praise ourselves of the da'wah we have done, this study just came out nationally. There is a lot of individuals who took the shahada whether it was a fault of the center, of the people that attended, that's besides the point. The idea is that these individuals first disappear from the masjid, or we have no way of linking up with them for one reason or the other, and then eventually they leave the fold of Islam. At this center, there is somebody who has done that. No need to mention names out of nothing that perhaps we have done, but perhaps out of something we may have done. I don't know. Perhaps the idea that when someone comes in and they are new as a Muslim or Muslima, they don't feel welcomed. They don't feel integrated to the center. Sometimes there are those who curse them because of the way they look, who demoralize them, who belittle them because of their learners and beginners in Islam and they quickly do what is known as takfir on them. A Rasul وسلم, was approached by one of the Sahaba. And the Sahaba told a Rasul وسلم, he said there is somebody making takfir on another person, a Muslim. And Rasul وسلم, sent him back and he said, tell them that one of them is a kafir. Meaning that the one who made takfir on that individual and if he is not correct, then he is the one who is a kafir. Or that person, it's true, maybe he's not a Muslim, he's a kafir. But one of them is a kafir. You see, from this hadith and from many other teachings, we open doors of centers to the beginners and learners of Islam. And we welcome them with open hands. We give them a sense of growth to experience Islam. I was listening to a lecture by Imam Siraj Wahaj at Tennessee State University several years back. He talks of a lecture that he was doing in London, England. And Alhamdulillah at that time, some of the British women, about three or four, came to him and they told him, we want to take the Shahada. Alhamdulillah. And he did the Shahada with them. This is after the lecture and he's continuing to mingle and socialize. About 20, maybe 15 minutes later, these same women rush back inside and they are in tears. So he tells them, okay, come down, what's going on? He says, well, you know, when we got outside, we were surrounded by Muslim sisters. And immediately they told us, you know, you cannot do this, this is haram, this is this. And they bombarded them with so much that they were overwhelmed on their first day. And they came back crying. You see, all of us have grown into Islam. Some of us may be more religious than others, but all of us took a journey into Islam. And all of us continue to grow in Islam. None of us can claim perfectness that is only the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who have no sins like al-malaika. But you and I are deficient beings. We make errors along the process, mistakes and other things that happen in our life. We correct some of them and some of them we continue to correct them. You must understand and appreciate 
that for new Muslim and Muslimas who are coming into Islam, who at home have families who are not Muslims, who are surrounded maybe with a new culture and environment and a new religion, that we have to be tolerant. The second story I want to share with you is the story of Suraq ibn Malik, radiallahu an. This is before he came into the fold of Islam. When Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was migrating from Mecca to at that time Yathrib, what is known now as al Medina, to Medina. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tried to escape the Quraysh. But there was a bounty hunter. A bounty hunter is someone who is sent out to get your head. So there was a bounty hunter. And the Quraysh sent this bounty hunter and he knew there would be no one who is able to find the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except him. Because he had the skills and the knowledge of the desert and he was a tracker so he could track people in the desert he was sent as a bounty hunter when he came finally to the proximity of the rasul وسلم, a conversation takes place between him and a rasul so now the rasul وسلم, is telling him this is a man who has come for his head come to get him to take him back, dead or alive. And for a moment he's asking the man who is the bounty hunter, have you ever thought of the superpower Persia? Persia at that time was a superpower of the region. Even the Romans, we are told historically, they were afraid of the Persians in warfare because the Persians were ruthless in warfare. They took no prisoners and they killed mercilessly. So even the Romans were afraid of the Persians. This is the power that the Rasul is talking about. And he's saying to Surah ibn Malik, can you imagine that one day you will be an individual that will wear the Kisra, the attire that the ruler of Persia wears, the ruler, the king, the garment that the king wears. Now, you know, a man, a bounty hunter is in front of him. This is the kind of dialogue he has with this man. To summarize, everybody part their ways. And Allah caused it such that Surah ibn Malik would go back. Later on, Surah ibn Malik عنه, would become a Muslim. What lesson do you take from this experience and the jawab, the reply that was given to Surah ibn Malik? The third story that I want to tell you about is of that known that person who is known as the first ambassador of Islam. An amazing young man who was in Aqaba til Ula, the first treaty of Aqaba. When he was sent back to Al Madina to now spread the message of Islam, such that by the time the Rasul وسلم, reached Al Madina and he migrated, almost every home had heard the message of Islam. And some had already accepted Islam. Walhamdulillah. But the Rasul Sallallahu had sent this young man, who we know historically is Mus'ab ibn Umair, radiallahu an, that he would go and do this work to prepare for a stage that was to come. What story do you take from the experiences of this young man? What lessons? Then there is the fourth lesson that I want to share with you and the story from Al-Anbiya wal Mursaleen. This is the story of Nuh alayhi salam. We had the brother one day when he was talking about Al-Akhirah, about Yawm Yaqum al-Hisab, that many of us when, during that time when we gather and we go behind each Al-Anbiya wal Mursaleen and we are asking them to ask Allah to begin the process because that is a time of difficulty, a lot of grief, a lot of suffering. And they go to Nuh alayhi salam. And Nuh says, Idhab ila Musa. Go to Musa alayhi salam. And the reason is that dua that he argues he made against his own people. And that is the dua 
when he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, La tathar ala al-ard min al-kafirin dayyara. Do not live on this earth any of the disbelievers because Nuh did not want to be succeeded by those who are min al-zalimin. From those who are oppressors of the earth. And the final story that I want to talk to you about is the story of Suhail ibn Amr. We know this individual was an extraordinary Quraysh. He was a linguist, articulate, mastered the language. And so when he spoke, people listened. He was a person of Mecca and among one of the leaders of Mecca. He is the one who negotiated in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah on, the behalf of, on behalf of the Quraysh. To the Quraysh, he was the Khatib and the best of the best in the Arabic language. So in the Battle of Badr, Suhail was captured as a POW, a prisoner of war. And so now he's paraded in front of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Omar is asking the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to give him permission so he can break the teeth of Suhail, the front teeth. He wants to punish him. And he tells the Rasul Sallallahu after this, he will never be able to say anything against you. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam refused for somebody to be mutilated in front of him. And he told Omar, and he said, Ya Omar, maybe Suhail one day will stand in a position that will be pleasing to you. What lesson do you take from that reply of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Omar came to remember this many years later. In Fatha Makkah, when Makkah was returned back to the Muslims, peacefully. The conquest of Makkah, the opening of Makkah. When now Suhail became a Muslim. But when the Rasul Sallallahu had passed, there were those among the Muslims who could not take that. And they went back to their kufr. One of the individuals that stood up to speak and convince them and use beautiful language and ask them to remain within Islam was Suhail ibn Amr. When Omar heard this, he remembered what the Rasul Sallallahu said, maybe one day Suhail will stand in a position that pleases you. And that position pleased the Muslims, not only Omar. So the lessons in a taif, more importantly, the Rasul وسلم, did not take action based on what happened. He wanted Islam to flourish in Arabia and he wanted to show tolerance, sensitivity, so that it can reach other parts of the world eventually. This is a vision that Rasul وسلم, had for Islam. And every community must have a long term vision. You cannot operate on the order of the day and not worry what is to happen in five years. I know Al-Qadha wa Al-Qadar is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Min arkanul iman. I know that. We all know that as Muslim, alhamdulillah. This is one of the pillars of iman. Everything is in the hands of Allah. But we have to have a sense of a vision, a long-term planning of some type. And so Rasul sallallahu when he did that, the ulama and the mufassirin have taken a beautiful message out of this. And they say this is the idea that the Rasul is looking at this concept of long-term planning. The same way how we welcome Muslims into the fold of Islam, the reverts. That we should also look about long-term plans with them. Establish that strong connection with them. In the case of Surak ibn Malik, later on when he came, to become a Muslim. Muslims eventually defeated the Persians. And when they conquered Persia, the Kisra, the attire, the wear of the king, at that time they honored Zuhail ibn Malik. From that story, Surah ibn Malik, they honored him. And he remembered what the Rasul وسلم, that he had a vision. He had a vision that Islam will remove oppression from the land and will remove the tyrants of the land. And the rulers of Persia were regarded tyrants, even by their own people. Then there's the story of Nuh, who did not want descendants 
who are minal zalimin because they will create a lot of facade on earth, corruption. And he didn't want them to be people who lived on earth and continue with the corruption. Then there's the story of Suhail. Once again, the Rasul sallallahu knew that people are capable of goodness. People have it in them. This is part of their fitra. They are capable of everything that is good. As much as evil that they do, they are also capable of goodness. And our Rasul sallallahu wanted Suhail to get that opportunity and that chance. So these examples, these lessons, the idea that we have long-term sense of a vision of our community, a vision of our ummah, that this is important. And the stories of Al-Anbiya wa Al-Mursaleen are not just stories because Rasul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this about them. He says this about them. He said, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَ That these are lessons, they are Ibra. And we must talk about these lessons and what we derive from them. Not just stories maybe that we tell each other and our children, but we take important lessons. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the lessons that we learn from the Quran and the life of these great men and other cases, women of Islam as well, for the sisters, is that everybody wanted a vision of a future that was better for the Ummah, that was better for the Masjid, that was better for the center, and for the Mujtama, for the community that they live in. What we see and know for a fact in our community and many other communities, if you travel throughout North America as a continent, meaning the US and Canada, and I saw this even in other countries, you'll find that nobody is really looking that far down the road. If you ask any center and say, where is it that you want to see yourself as a community 10 years from now? Many centers, as successful as they are, they do not have an answer for this. You can bring it down to five years, and in many cases, the answer is the same. Alhamdulillah, many people are looking at next year. Many of us are looking, what are we going to do for Ramadan? How are we going to move on to uh, the Hajj, you know, when it comes in? It's one of the pillars of Islam. But this idea that we have to develop long-term vision, this is a very important concept in Islam. Because once again, we are interested not only in the Islam of ourselves, but the Islam of our children and the children of our children. والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين ومن ولا. Those of you who came late, we started talking about what is known in Islam as Ibra, these lessons. And we narrated four stories, five stories really, to show you how important that we take these important understandings and put them into practice in our community. But you know, for that to happen, you know, this center, I tell many people, was not built by one, two, three, or four people. Those of us who started in the board, who may have left, who may have come back, whatever the case might be. No. This center was started by all of you. It is your center. You are a part of the process of the growth of this center. Walhamdulillah, barakallahu feekum. May Allah bless you all and your families with Al-Jannah. But it was built by hard work. There may have been brothers who continue to work hard to lead us and push the way forward. But the idea is that this center has come around. Alhamdulillah, when we knew it would be impossible, but the vision that people had, that it can be done and it was done, it was done by all of you. And once again, we are at that one year mark of the center. Can you imagine when we first started? 
when we were still trying to lay down carpet, when we were still trying to do the sister's area, when we expanded and went into the multipurpose room and the growth continues. Well, alhamdulillah, the center has signed a contract to refurbish the front of the building. It will have a beautiful name in front, Islamic Center of Tennessee. Well, alhamdulillah, Islam has a presence in Antioch and in Tennessee and in this world, in this part of the world. But you know, anything like that involves funds, donations, money, support. And so once again, the center is asking for every able person to contact the office, the brothers in the board, and alhamdulillah, you know who the contacts are, and to continue to support the center in this effort. Know that Ramadan will come. Alhamdulillah. May Allah give us good health and good life to see Ramadan again and to continue to do the ibadah during that month. Alhamdulillah, Ramadan programs are many usually and they will continue to serve you. And once again, the board and the leadership of the masjid has to continue to prepare to give you this place and service so you can, Alhamdulillah, continue to come here and enjoy using the center. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I want, you to, I want to leave you with this beautiful message. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ إِبْرَى That in their lives and in their stories, these great men of Islam, the Anbiya wal Mursaleen and others, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us these are lessons. And the lessons are clear in this instance. Ibad Allah. إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ربنا عاتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك بارك الله لي ولكم بالقرآن والسنة ونفعني وإياكم بما فيهما من الآيات والذكر والحكم أقول ما تسمعون وأقيم الصلاة إن الصلاة تنهى عن الفخشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تسمعون before you leave after we finish the salah there are very important announcements for the summer I don't have time I do ask for you to stay back two minutes won't take more than that بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم